Welcome back everyone to Vox Markets. My name is Paul Hill and I'm delighted today to have with me Colin King, CEO of Amiga Diagnostics, a leading UK medical diagnostics and uh, COVID-19 testing firm. Welcome, Colin. Hi, Paul. How are you? Okay. Yeah, very good. Um, in the order, in the order of play today is that Colin's going to take us through a presentation, and then we're going to open it up to uh, Q and A from the floor. And if you would like to submit a question then please do so. There's a tab, I think, at the bottom where you could submit questions and I will ask those as uh, as we go forward. So um, over to you, Colin. Yeah, thanks, Paul. First, I'd like to um, um, take this opportunity to thank Turner Pope for giving me the, the opportunity to provide more of an insight about Omega. Hopefully, this presentation will highlight that we have other, other exciting opportunities in addition to the COVID work that we are currently undertaking. Um, this presentation, I'll hope to give an overview um, of our core business and products. Um, in terms of our, our core business, um, Omega is a medical diagnostic company focused in two segments within the global diagnostic industry. Um, in terms of global health, we have two products, um, Visitech CD4, uh, which is used to manage patients living with HIV. And, and more recently, we've moved into COVID testing, um, where our focus is both on antibody and antigen testing, and those tests being provided um, in, in the lab, primary care, and self-test settings. In terms of our food intolerance business, um, this is a testing which is really is a more efficient way than the traditional food elimination processes that are used to identify foods that are um, that are given sort of chronic diseases such as irritable bowel syndrome. In terms of um, CD4 advanced disease, this is where we really see the greatest potential um, for for revenue growth. Um, and, and the reason for this is, is really the, in terms of the WHO. Um, they um, implemented a strategy where they would test, uh, anybody that tested positive for HIV would be given antiviral drugs um, as a way to reduce the mortality rate of people living with HIV. This was very successful for them and, and really drove down the number of deaths um, per annum of people um, dying of HIV. However, what they found over the last few years is that that, that progress has plateaued and it's plateaued at somewhere around about 1 million um, people every year still dying of, of HIV. Um, when they looked into the reasons for that, what they found was that the patients with a CD4 count of below 200 were at extremely high risk of dying and, and they, weren't, they weren't dying of um, HIV, they were dying of other opportunistic diseases such as um, um, TB. Um, so clearly they, what they wanted to do was address this problem. Um, they, they developed a strategy and obviously CD4 is a key part of that strategy. And they developed a product, pro, um, a TPP, a, a product pro, for, profile. Um, and within that profile, um, what they have outlined is that they want an instrument-free point of care test. Um, and, you know, we took that profile, we developed a, a, a um, we, we, we have a 350 test. What we did was we um, reconfigured that test um, to, to a test line of 200. Um, and that, that test is actually the only instrument-free point of care test that is available in the world today. It also has patent protection as well. So it obviously puts us in a very strong position to, to help deliver um, on this WHO initiative. Um, the WHO... Um, as part of this initiative, they granted a, a $20 million fund to, to Unitaid um, and Chai, who are the implementing partners, to, to basically implement the Advanced Disease Initiative. Um, and that covers both CD4 testing and obviously testing for these opportunistic diseases and obviously the medicines that are required to do this. Um, what the, the program with Unitaid and Chai is outlined to do is basically um, they've got to um, work out the processes to, to get this strategy implemented in all low middle income countries. 
Um, we signed an agreement with um, Unidade and Chai in, 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 in April this year, um, which gives them access to, to our test. Um, and what they're doing is they're basically they're going to they're, they're starting with sort of half a dozen countries, um, where they're using these countries as test beds to get their processes in place. And um, those tests um, are, are will start are just started to be shipped um, last last month and, and later on this year as well. Um, they then get those pol um, policies and procedures in place, and then once they're fully in place in those countries, they then roll, start to roll that out to all low middle income countries. This program is designed just to get that, that process started. And then what will happen is the, the, basically the Global Fund and an organization called PEPFAR, and PEPFAR are actually the, the largest donor for HIV care in the world. They're backed by the US government. Um, and interestingly, with PEPFAR, the, their own guidance has said that they will only procure um, inexpensive lateral flow CD4 tests. And as I've already alluded to, we are the only company that, that can offer this test. Um, so basically, the Global Fund and PEPFAR will, will come in be, behind um, Unity and Chai and provide long-term funding for these, these countries um, to ensure that this initiative is, is um, carried out in the long term. Um, in addition to, to, to UnitAid um, and this program, there's also MSF who are separately funded. Um, they, they have been a long-term advocate of, of advanced disease CD4, and they were really key, a key player in, in getting WHO guidance set up. Um, they helped us um, complete a multi-centre study in three countries in Africa. Um, and the results of that study were, were exactly as what, what was expected. So the, the outcome was it's a test that is ideal for decentralised settings. Um, so where they are today is they're, they're about to start deploying that in their sites um, around, around, around the world. Um, the, they had hoped to get started earlier than this, but clearly COVID has had, a, has had an impact in, in the deployment of, of the test. But no, they are indicating that they will they will start start to procure in, in H2 in our financial year H2. Um, then finally, in terms of that selling strategy, um, we have the the um, UN agencies. Um, the good th they they required a WHO pre qualification, and as I said earlier, we've we received that in July this this year this year. So that allows them to start to, to look to procure and include it in their, their in their programs and in their budgets. So we've started to engage with these organisations to ensure that they're included in their budgets um, for, 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 for next year and, and beyond. Um, so in terms of, you know, that give, gives you, a, hopefully gives you a feel for the, the importance of, of the test that we have and also the uniqueness of the test that we have. In terms of giving you a feel for what the opportunity is, um, what Unity and Chai um, early on were were keen for us to 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 establish was our manufacturing capacity. Um, what they outlined was that we needed to get a manufacturing capacity of somewhere between four to six million tests per annum within the next two to three years. So that's ex that's what they're expecting that the, the, the overall output will be. Um, and get, again, just to give you a feel, the selling price is four dollars a test. And it's approximately a 70% margin. So hopefully you can see that it's a very significant opportunity that we have in front of us with, with CD4. And currently it's very minimal sales. So all, all upside as, as, we, as, we, as we move forward over the next two to three years. Moving on from CD4 to, to COVID. Um, before I go through um, the antibody testing, I'll just um, sort of maybe position what our overall strategy in COVID was. When the pan pandemic um, outbreak occurred, we, we realised that, that we had um, the, the skills, especially in lateral flow um, manufacturing, that you know not a lot of other organisations had, um, and that you know there would there would be a demand for that type of testing um, globally. Um, and what we wanted to do was was basically offer that service out. Um, we also realised um, that you know there would be a need for both antigen and antibody testing. So antigen testing confirming if you, you currently have COVID and antibody testing confirming if you if you have previously had COVID. Um, and so, so that was really our overall strategy um, was that we wanted a position in both um, and also be, to be able to cover the lab um, settings, primary care and self-testing settings. And our aim was then to look to how can we build our capacity up 
Um, and the reason being that we build our capacity up, then we can flex that capacity to wherever the demand was coming, whether it be for antibody or antigen testing. Um, so that's our overall strategy. Um, we've made making good progress in terms of building our capacity up. Um, so we're, we're, we, we've got up to 100,000 tests per week. By the end of this month, we'll be up at 200,000 tests per week. And by the end of the, the calendar year, we'll be up at half a million tests per week. Um, we, we had indicated in terms of looking to go up to 1 million tests per week. Um, one thing that we're looking, looking at, um, especially with the, the recent announcements around um, um, from the UK government around moonshot and antigen testing, is, is there a way to actually um, get a greater capacity than 1 million tests per week? And how could we achieve that within the existing footprint that we have within our buildings? That's something that we are currently looking at. Um, and trying to establish what the best way of taking our capacity from half a million up to something in, the, in, a, in excess of one million tests per week. Um, and we I'd hope to have that sort of squared off within the, within the, the month of October and get that procurement for instrument instrumentation that we need, equipment we would need in place. So that's kind of our overall strategy in terms of COVID. Um, and then diving into antibody testing, um, you know, we, this is where we're probably for, further forward than, 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 than we are with antigen testing currently. Um, we have um, three products that are commercially available now um, in terms of the ELISA um, anti, antibody test. And that has been CMART. We have had um, first commercial sales. We're going through a regulatory process that, you know, frustratingly has taken a little bit longer than, than, than I previously indicated. Um, but I think in terms of ELISA testing, where, where I outlined previously, where we see the, the, the key differentiator is, is with our test is that and rather than use, using a venous draw, which a lot of tests, lab tests require, um, we were looking to, to adopt a capillary blood, which is a finger, finger pick of blood. Um, that could be taken from, from a, a sample collection pack, which could be done at home, then sent back to the lab. Where, where we are to date with that is that we have completed the um, usability, sorry, the, the capillary blood val validation. So we know that um, a venous draw versus a finger pick of blood um, is the, 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 the performance is, is equivalent. Um, where we stand today is we're completing a a usability study, in other words, how easy is it for an individual, an unskilled individual, to, to use the, the sample collection pack, get the finger pick of blood, and obviously then return that to the lab. We expect to have that complete during October, and I think that will really then help us drive our, our ELISA sales um, in, in, the, in the coming months ahead. As I mentioned, I think where we see the largest volume is, is in lateral flow testing um, because of the, the ease of use um, and the ability to run it um, in, in situ. Um, we have two products, um, both that are both um, CE marked. Um, the first product is for professional use. Um, that is, and we'd be running primary care settings. That was um, established through a partnership with Mologic. Um, we see mark that test in September this year, um, and we've now started the process of commercialization, com commercializing that test, um, and that we're really targeting, the, you know, our existing export markets, that, export distributors that we have um, established with our, our core business already. So there, that's our target market there, um, and we'd expect to see um, some um, revenue generation, as I outlined previously, you know, towards the end of October, November timeframe is when we'd start to, to see um, revenues being generated for that test. In terms of the, um, the other test that we have available is obviously the one that's been pretty well highly publicised. It's the, the one that we, the, for the UKRTC, which was a, a consortium that was put together of four companies by the, the UK government. Um, made exceptional progress there in terms of we see marked the test um, already. That was C marked in, in end of July, early August. We're currently awaiting MHRA approval for self-test use. Um, the, all the documentation has been submitted to MHRA and they are currently reviewing that. In terms of timelines, it's, it is difficult to, to, to tell what the timeline will be for approval. It will really come down to what questions that MHRA ask, if any, um, and, and the level of detail that's required in terms of responses to those questions that will drive what that ultimate approval timeline looks like. Um, but we're certainly very active in, in, in working through that just now. 
In terms of the, the contract with the UK government, clearly this has taken longer than I'd previously indicated and has become a source of frustration for all of us. What I can say is that we are now very close to finally concluding this. Once it is concluded, this will supersede the MOU and allow the consortium to finalise an agreement between the four companies. Just as a reminder, we are gearing up to produce 200,000 tests per week for the consortium. Initially, this will be around 100,000 tests until mid to end of November, when we have the increase of capacity available that I um, referred to earlier. Also, as previously indicated, once the, the contract is concluded, um, this will allow us to be in a position to, to commercialise the test outside the UK government. Um, our partner, SEGA, has already started to market the test within their global network. And clearly, once we start to receive demand um, from these, the, these other areas, the consortium will notify the market accordingly. I think that covers all the exciting opportunities we have with antibody testing and that we finally moving forward into the commercialization phase um, for antibody testing. Then moving on to antigen testing, um, where, where we are, I think everybody's kind of aware in terms of antigen testing. It's, it's obviously, a, it's, it's in the news quite a lot just now. Um, obviously PCR testing is, is, is primarily how, how an, the, the testing is carried out just now, whether it be lab based and obviously rec more recently there has been point of care real-time PCR tests coming into the market as well. Um, where we see a huge opportunity is, um, especially you know, following that um, moonshot announcement by the UK government, is, is with the um, lateral flow point of care test. Um, we have partnered with Mologic um, and obviously we're, they, they are currently working through the development of that product. Um, has been publicised that they, that they have um, issued some prototype tests um, for an evaluation at Heathrow, which is going relatively successfully um, or, or very positively. Um, the, the next stage is obviously for MoLogic to complete that validation, complete that development, and then do the verification and validation that's required to see mark the test. And then once they have that completed, then we can obviously then come in and, and tech transfer that methods and then add that into, into our Alva facility and utilize that capacity that we've been, that we've been building up. Um, I would say, I think I'd indicated previously that, that our aim is, that, that is to have that available by Christmas, or if it's not a, a nice Christmas present, it would certainly be a present to, to us in, in terms of the, in, in the early new year. Um, so, you know, that's kind of the, the, the timeline that we're looking looking at to bring this test into the market. As I say, clearly there is a lot of interest in this test, um, the, given the, the, um, the ability to, to, to run the test in, in situ and obviously using saliva as a sample te technique, sample um, type as well is far easier than the current swab methods um, that, that are currently in place just now that's required for PCR testing. So again, so in terms of COVID, hopefully I've given you a good feel for you know our overall strategy, how we're building our capacity up and where, where, where we currently are with both antibody and antigen testing. So you know, a lot to look forward to over, over the, the, the coming months ahead in terms of as, as we progress with, with both, on both these fronts. Then in terms of the final product range um, is, is our food intolerance business. Um, basically, um, we have three products um, or two products and a service. And we have a, a, a point of care um, test available and a, and a lab test. And we also offer a lab service as well within, within the UK. And this business um, is, is, has got global coverage in over 75 countries. Um, you know, very successfully um, grown that business to, to last year, we generated 9.2 million in revenues and very cash generative 3.9 million EBITDA. Um, I think we've, we've already notified the markets that you know, COVID has had an impact in the first half of this year. And um, so we do expect the, the, revenue, the overall revenues for, for this financial year to be a little bit lower than that. And um, the encouraging signs, though, is that, you know, our, our distributing partners are coming back on board um, and the, the um, testing is starting to pick up again. Um, so, so in terms of that, we're, we're very much in line with where we expect to be with the guidance that's in the, the FinCAP research note. Um, however, in terms of food intolerance, where we see 
the largest opportunity to really um, grow the grow our revenues in, in the in the short to mid term is, is is a strategy we implemented a few years ago was in China. Um, we we identified a, a specific Chinese partner, um, and what we worked together was to develop. I mean, we we developed a specific food panel for the Chinese market. Um, that specific food, food food panel has gone through an approval process um, with the Chinese authorities, and in March this year, um, our partner received approval for lab testing. Um, and currently, what they're focusing on is is getting approval for self testing. That's ongoing. Um, they've completed all the studies. It's been submitted to the Chinese authorities, and they are currently reviewing the documentation that's been submitted by our partner. So again, very similar to the MHRA process. You know, we're we're basically in a waiting game in terms of get, get, getting that approval and getting understanding if if how how quick it will be. Um, but we do expect it to to be to, to be received soon. Um, the in terms of our partner, they've already procured a, a large number of tests. It was um, ninety thousand tests were were, were procured um, last year, and we already shipped twenty thousand tests in in June. And just to give you an overall feel as well in terms of the spend from our partner, you know, th this company has, has invested over two million dollars in getting this test. You know, not only through all these approval processes, but they've also developed a Chinese specific app. I think that gives you an indication for you know the, the the value that they see in this test, and, and to put some color to that, basically our Chinese partner was indicating that by 2023, the once they have um, received self test approval, they could see where the demand would be somewhere around about one million tests per annum. And in terms of turning that into revenues, basically we, we charge um, $15 a test and it's around about a 70% margin. So you can see that this opportunity here alone is quite transformational for our um, food intolerance business um, in, in, the, in the coming years ahead. In terms of the, as I touched on, we are, we're clearly developing um, increasing our capacity for lateral flow testing, which is, you know, in the short term, very much focused towards COVID. But, you know, like all of us, at some point, we're, I'm very hopeful that COVID will, 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 will get under control and that those, those um, um, output capacity requirement will, will start to drop off for COVID. Um, clearly, in terms of those tests that I touched on for CD4, that will consume a reasonable amount of that capacity that we, that we will have built up. But we see an opportunity to 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 supplement CD4 and sub utilize that capacity in in a, in a in a in the mid to long term as well, and provide further growth opportunities within the global health um, business unit. Um, and we've identified two products, um, Cryptococcus and TB Lam. Basically, these two products are complementary to that advanced disease package of care. And um, so, I already mentioned where. You know, if an H, if a patient um, has a CD4 count below 200, then they will be tested for these diseases to see if any of if they're they're positive for any of them, and then obviously get the, the treatment for for the specific disease. So we're we're just about to start that development program now, um, and you know, in terms of both of them, obviously we we anticipate Cryptococcus being sort of lower technical risk and being able to bring that to the market within the next couple of years. And TB Lam is probably looking at a sort of three-year time frame to bring that to the market. But clearly good opportunities as, as we look for, further forward beyond COVID in terms of um, being able to grow that global health business unit as well, in addition to the growth potential on CD4. So then in summary, um, I think hopefully I've given you a good flavour for the, the excellent opportunities we have in, in COVID, both in antibody and antigen testing, and how we're building that capacity up to be able to flex that, that, that to, to meet those demands. Um, but also, and I think importantly, is that you know we are more than just a COVID, COVID company. Um, we, we have two exciting product ranges in terms of global health with CD4 and their food intolerance business as well, both of which are great. Um, and growth potential in, in the coming years ahead. And hopefully I've, during this presentation, I've given you a feel for, for what those look like. Um, so, so I'd just like to thank you for taking the time to, to, to listen to this presentation. And I'll just hand over in terms of any, any questions that, that may come from it. Thank you.
Many thanks, Colin. Um, just looking at the actual um, the questions which are coming in, there's been a lot of uh, discussion in terms of the uh, antigen and the antibody testing. I mean, it's in a, the company's in a beautiful position. It's almost being swamped by demand. I was just looking at the latest stats from the government, and they're uh, running at about 310,000 tests per day, uh, which, if you just do the maths, is over 2.1, 2.2 million tests a week. And you were mentioning on some of the, you know, your volume, your demand, et cetera, your, or as you say, your, your capacity is sort of 100,000 per week to 200. How much capacity are you sort of aiming for at the end of this year and into next year to meet some of the, you know, the huge demand just in, in the UK, never mind overseas? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Paul. Um, in terms of the, the demand, as I, as I outlined, you know, by the end of the year, our expectations is we'll be up to half, be able to produce half a million tests. And as I said, our strategy was very much that we wanted to build the capacity that we can then flex that to, you know, wherever the demand was coming from, whether it be antigen or antibody testing. Um, clear, clearly, we're going to get the antigen test into, the, you know, transferred and into production. Um, but once the, the, that's available towards the end of the year, you know, we'll be very much in a position where we can flex that capacity. And, and as I mentioned already in the presentation, the next step that I'm really looking hard at just now is we had we had been looking at producing a million lateral flow tests um, per, per week. And what I've been looking at um, recently is whether how I can actually increase that further to you know perhaps two to two and a half million tests per week um, and within the existing f footprint that we that we have within our building, so that's a piece of work that I'm currently um, looking at just now, um, with the aim to be able to actually start start that procurement process um, this month. Okay, and if you it's sort of big picture wise, if you had unlimited capacity, how much would the UK government be able to buy from you? I mean, it, it wants to obviously increase its daily capacity at least twofold from its current level. Uh, and, and that and that would take it to sort of like you know I don't know three three million to five million tests a week. If you had unlimited capacity, how much could you currently sell to the UK government? Um, I, I think in terms of I think just now where the UK government is, I think they're really focused more, more a lot on antigen testing. Um, so so I think in terms of antigen testing, yeah, I think you'd be talking sort of the t t tens tens of millions. I think um, is 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 probably what what their demand demand would be okay and what do you need then you, you say you're trying to flex the capacity to get it to sort of half a million by the year end you, you mentioned on in the um, in the presentation you were sort of buying some equipment or increasing the capacity. how i mean it's almost like we want to sort of like a, a, a donald trump warp speed type of production to be able to to get you know to, to really to help the nation as much as anything i mean this is a sort of like a such a national requirement um and i know you know it, it's 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 it, you can't just turn the tap on and this sort of stuff but what are sort of like the the roadblocks or should we say what what are the sort of the gates that we need to pass over the hurdles before we can get to that sort of level of volume in, ter in terms of the um, capacity building, it's obviously we um, a, f a few a few months back we obviously started to procure equipment. Um, that obviously the equipment does have lead times, um, and then it, w once the, the piece of equipment arrives in a facility, you know we can't just switch it on and, and start using it. We've got to validate that validate that we can actually um, use it reliably. You know, it's people's health that, that we're that, you know we're manufacturing, so you know, we've got to make sure that you know every test that we produce. Is of the highest quality because um, you know ultimately it is, it is people's health that, that's at, that's that's at risk if, if we get that wrong. Um, so it's very much you've got a, a validation process. We've got a team um, the that are very much focused on on making sure that when that piece of equipment comes in that that it's that it's validated as quickly as possible. And, and obviously everybody is aware of the urgency of getting these these, these pieces of equipment up and running. Um, we we basically there's three pieces of key equipment that's needed. Um, that there's a what's called a bio dot reel to reel. We've taken delivery of that. Um, there's a basically to to pouch the devices. And we we've taken delivery of of that piece of equipment. And the the last piece of equipment is due in um, during October is a cassetting machine that so it actually puts the it cuts the cards and puts the the cards into a cassette and seals it. Um, that that allows us to get up from two hundred thousand up to the, the the half a million tests um, um, per week. And um, so that's expected that, to arrive. Where's that cassetting machine coming from? Is it abroad or is it in the UK? 
Uh, no, so that machine is actually coming in from Finland. Um, okay. So, so yeah, we, yeah. And it's, it's built, it's design. actually there, it's just a matter of just getting it over the channel. Um, well, it's, it's, it's in the final stages of, of building. We will be doing a, um, a virtual in, in this uh, COVID world. Normally you would do a factory acceptance where you would you'd fly over to Finland and you would run, run it over there. But we're, what we're doing is using Zoom to um, virtually um, you know, confirm that the, the machine is, is meeting the specifications that we want. And then I'll get packaged up and then shipped over and will we'll be with us um, by, the, the, by the end of this month. Okay. And then the, another question which is coming in is in, in terms of the antigen, it's just the final approval. So as I understand it from the presentation, we have all the CE marks for the antibody test, and it's a matter of sort of building them, building the capacity to be able to sell it. And we've got sales happening hopefully by the end of the month, et cetera. But in the antigen, which is obviously to test whether somebody has it, in the say maybe saliva or blood or whatever, um, you know, what other approvals are, are required? It, it seems to be quite a few questions in terms of the Mo Logic um, uh, approval yeah. process. Yeah. So, so I mean, basically, Mo Logic's test is, is currently in development just now. Um, the um, I think they made excellent progress w with this test. Um, the um, and as, as I alluded to in, in, the, in the presentation, they have um, um, sent some prototypes to, to Heathrow, um, which you know the, the results were, were positive. Um, they are looking to send further prototypes for evaluation, um, and you know it, it'll be in other sites within the UK um, to test the performance. And once we get a feel, or once they get a feel that that performance is is meeting the the, the required levels, then that will allow them to complete their development. And at that point, we we'll jump in and, and and work with them and start that technical transfer of getting their methods and bring it into back up to our facility in Alva. Um, which will allow us to also make the test as well. So not only will we have their capacity, but our capacity as well. And what sort of timeline do you think that will be to to get to that stage? Yeah, as I said, my my my, my expectation would be that that we that you know sort of Christmas time frame would be. Yeah. Um, I, be the I, that's the Christmas present, hopefully. Yeah. Okay, you've certainly got a lot on your hands here, and I'll, I'll just give you another one onto onto your hands. We've got some pretty. Um, Pretty smart questions coming in, actually. Was uh, I mean, I suppose it's not a surprise, but there's been quite a bit of press speculation. I think the Yorkshire Post has busted a big article in terms of potentially linking up Omega with a Vactor as a potential manufacturer. Given where you are, you're going to struggle making anything other than you know, what you can fill, your, fill yourself to a certain extent. But uh, is there anything you can say in terms of that, or is that just pure speculation? Um, it, it's. I think it's a, a little bit premature. I would say in terms of what, what the article um, published, and um, we, we we have um, had some discussions with with Avacta, um, and you know that's certainly a, 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 an option that's open to us. Um, but basically, what we want to do is, as I said, you know, we we realise that that we have the skills and expertise to produce these tests, um, and really what what we want to do is to, to produce them. And I think you touched on it already in terms of just helping the UK recover and get out of this the, 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 the situation. And you know we'll do whatever we need to do to 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 help facilitate that. Um, and and if it means that we 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 bring in a VAT to test as well, then we'll do that. You know. And the one thing which is, well, I've read the FinCap note, and uh, one thing they talk about are these sort of peak sales, et cetera, for both the antigen and the antibody test. But one thing it doesn't say, and this is sort of longer term, so nobody's going to hold you to it, but the, assuming COVID's going to last forever and we have a vaccine, the vaccine only going to give you immunity for three to six months. So you're still going to, and people, not everybody's going to get flipping vaccinated anyway. So there's still going to be an ongoing recurring requirement as there is every single year when people need to be tested for flu and other sort of like, you know, coronaviruses. Presumably this falls into the same bucket. So if you've got, yes, you, your capacity will give you spare capacity once we're through in two, three, four years time. But presumably this is still going to set up some recurring revenue streams. Yeah, yeah. I think there was definitely be an, an, on, an ongoing um, requirement in terms of COVID. I don't think it's just going to stop in, in you know, next year. Um, I would certainly expect there to be an ongoing going, um, revenue stream there. And if you take the antibody testing, for example, and you touch on the vaccine, you know, one of the key things that, that the antibody, you know, if you've got a vaccine and you want to know how long that immunity is lasting, the only way you're going to be able to know that is to, to use an antibody test. Because um, that that'll be ch you know, checking those levels. So I think antibody testing 
alongside that vaccine will be very crucial. Um, and then, yeah, as you're, you're right, you know, there will, there will be some, some um, ongoing um, COVID will continue. So the need for antigen testing will also be there as well um, in, in, the, in the middle of it. People who are into the high contact jobs, whether you work in the medical trade, in hospitals, whether you're delivery drivers, whether you're barbers, anybody who's, who's, who's actually con, you know, interfacing with the public, probably for their own marketing purposes, is going to need to be able to say to customers coming into their shops and all their, all their visitors, etc., that they are totally free. And the only way to show that is having an almost like a, an antibody passport, and it may be for international travel. So it could become an actual statutory requirement in the longer term to to show that you are COVID free. Yeah, and that, I perhaps. think that, no, exactly, and, and I think that's certainly the, the, uh, been muted, um, you know, a few months ago, not just by the UK government but by a number of governments. That's obviously going to be a government policy that that will drive that, um, but that to me would be the central outcome as, as you look look beyond um, in, into into the middle of next year and beyond. And sort of the, the competition for these areas. I mean, you've had some big news last week. I think it was a couple of guys who, uh, I think one of them was Abbott Lab saying they've got a 30-minute test antigen that um, is point of care at home. Um, how do you see that sort of playing out? Is it just really the worldwide demand for these tests is just so enormous yeah. that, frankly, it doesn't matter. It just, you know, you can produce, anything you produce can get sold. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly it. You know, if you take take the worldwide, this this isn't just a UK problem. This is a, a global pandemic. So, you know, every diagnostic manufacturer, I think, has a play as a place to play in in helping this recovery. Um, so, I think there is room for everybody in in this market. There, there's no one company that will dominate over another. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, I see it as a um, yeah a, a market that's available for everybody. I yeah. think the the, the I mean, key yeah, I was just sort of thinking big picture wise. And if you've got in two, three years time, if you've got 7 billion people and I don't know, let's say half a billion of them go traveling each year and you need it as a passport, then that's a lot of tests they're going to have to have. They're going to be mandated to do before they're allowed to go anywhere to hotels and go, you know, sort of like uh, on flights, etc. cetera. So um, that's good. Um, yeah. In terms of the IPR, is there any IPR which you, you built up, or is it really just manufacturing resource from the COVID side, from the antigen and the um, yeah. the antibody testing? In, in, ter in terms of the um, um, COVID side, it's very much just our manufacturing capability and obviously the, the agreements that we have in place with the uh, various companies that we're working with. Okay. And then you, you talked about sort of like... Um, first revenues that's in the end of this month, which is only, what, three weeks away. That means you've probably signed orders already, haven't you? Um, that, yeah, yeah, we're, we're, yeah, so, so our Mologic test, we're starting to see demand coming in, uh, which which is encouraging. Um, the yeah. And I think, and as I alluded to, you know, the, the UK government contract um, is, is key here. Um, you know, my expectation is that we're going to get that very soon. Um, and then really what that does is it, it, it's not just supplying um, that those initial orders to the UK government, it gives us the opportunity to start selling that UK rapid test, um, which has you know, um, got the, the UK government stamp on it. So it has a, has a significant value to it, um, you know, not just within the UK, but obviously outside the UK. And that's really where um, one of our partners within the consortium has already started to, to market the product and, and is, is already seeing some, some significant interest. Okay, and then just turning, um, sort of shifting gears to the food, the food tolerance stuff. The the actual food doctor test that you mentioned, what does it actually test for? Does it is it sort of the classic gluten, soya, milk, egg, meat, all that sort of stuff? Or um, no, what, what it's doing is it's actually looking for um, food substances in your blood. Um, so so if you think about it, you really shouldn't have any any you know when you, you run a um, take, take a blood sample you really shouldn't be um, picking up any any traces of foods in your blood that basically means that your your gut's got a, what they call a leaky gut so foods are getting out through through your gut into your bloodstream and and what our test does it, it picks up those those um, those antibodies that, that are that are that are in the blood and um, for those specific foods um, so it's really a, I say classically what you would do um, if you, you know you've got that sort of irritable bowel you'll go to the GP they'll eventually refer you to the 
to the hospital and the hospital will say, well, try removing milk and then that doesn't work. They'll say, try removing this and that doesn't work. And before you know it, you've spent, you know, eight, nine months in pain still trying to find what the, those offending um, foods are. What our test does is it, it just removes all that and it can find those offending foods, you know, through, through, through a blood sample. And then obviously we, what you can then do is remove them, you know, and with the support of a nutritionist with food supplements or replacement diet. Right. Okay. And it's actually it's approved in the UK, isn't it? I mean, as in, like, it, it isn't a sort of yeah. like. Yeah. No. It's it's available. I mean, we, we actually we most of our sales are outside the UK. It's it's in a, it's available yeah. in over seventy five countries worldwide today. Um. So so yeah. I mean, we 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 built that business up when we took it over from you know basically a UK business and one or two distributors um in Europe to to now. Uh, where, where we've got yeah over seventy five um, countries that we we dispute to, um, so so yeah. it's globally available. Is it is it is it on the NHS sort of like um, therapeutic diagnostics? No, it isn't. No, it's a separate sort of it's like an over the counter thing. Is it? Yeah. Okay. And what, why is it yeah. so? Why is it so applicable in China compared to not in Europe and the US? Is it because they have more problems of absorbing Western food? Um, um, it's, it's it's not so much applicable in China. It's just the sheer number of people in China uh, when you compare it to, to, to other. So so yeah. if, if you if you can divide the, the the Chinese population, so you know a, mil, a million tests per, per per annum in China is you know, um, yeah, okay. you know, the um, but I think you know we, we have focused um, on on China. We've had some 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 you know we're very confident that that test will. Will, will make a great traction there. I think you touched on the US. I think the US is another huge opportunity um, for us. Mm. Um, we, 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 we've um, tried in the past and we've had a, some issues with distributors. Um, I think we were re revising that strategy and I, I expect us next year to come out with a, with a, a strategy that will give us success in the US. Um, and I think the US, has, it's actually the largest health and wellbeing market in the world. Um, mm. So I think cracking that, as China gives us, you know, that additional opportunity. So you can see if you can, you know, generate revenues in China and, and America of similar scale, all of a sudden you're you're heading towards a 40, 50 million pound business um, from the 10 yeah. million that it is today. Um, so so that, and that's certainly what, what our, our aim is, is to is to, 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 to grow that business successfully in, in those those key markets and obviously in, in the additional markets that we're in already. And is that pattern protected? The sort of the food, or was it trade just trademark um, trademark protected? Yeah, I mean there are some patterns, but predominantly it is no it is know how um, that, that we have. Yeah. Okay. Okay, and then moving quickly onto the um, the HIV CD four applicability. I mean, what what other markets do you think you can sell that into? In terms of obviously, it's more into sort of the, the H, H, WHO and these kind of guys. The, is it, is it? Are they taking the worldwide distribution of it and then pushing it into the relevant countries, or is it sort of like you targeting countries like Nigeria separately? Um, so, 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 really, it's all low middle income countries that the tests are applicable in, um, and 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 most of these, the, the sort of the 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 way that um, it's funded is in in most of these countries, it's primarily funded through um, NGOs who, who are who are in country. Um, and, and providing that funding for the country, uh, the, that particular country, to um, obviously allow the test to come in and, 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 and help their population. So it's very much NGO driven, and that's where where we focus a lot of a lot of our um, energy. The good thing for us actually is with it being NGO driven is you know clearly a lot of these countries, if you're selling direct, there's there is obviously risks about being paid, uh, because we're actually working through um, UN agencies or you know, organisations like MSF or, or or Clinton Health. You know, clearly they're they're financed, so so we get paid paid for for them without you know in terms of so so there's no financial risk for us in terms of bad debt. So despite going into these countries, uh, which is obviously okay. a challenge if you go in direct. Yeah, yeah, and you've got very little competition as well, haven't you? Effectively in the CD four stuff, well, which is it, a, it, it, perfect. The test is. It is the only um, um, instrument free yeah. CD4 test available in the world. So yeah, I mean, we're basically a clear, clear shot at goal in this one. And the and the other products, the newer products. 
when you say push the clock forward two, three years, and we've gone through the peak of uh, COVID, you've got recurring revenue streams from your antigen, your bio, your your, your, um, your antibody tests. You've got obviously growing on in, in China with the food tolerance, and uh, you're growing obviously with your HIV. But with these new tests, is that the sort of strategy is to use that volume out of your existing out of the facility that will be back backfilling the uh, the antigen and the um, the antibody stuff? So you effectively you're, you're proofing your business model today with COVID for expansion next, you know, in two to three years' time. That is it. That's exactly the strategy, um, and obviously that we've identified two complementary products that sit alongside CD4 um, and, and we're also looking at you know at other options um, around that global health space in terms of how we can um, you know as, as that capacity drips off how we could utilize that capacity in, in that area um, so, yeah. so yeah that's uh, the, 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 new product, the new products you're bringing on are they going to be unique and patented almost like the ones you've got with the CD4 is that the the aim of it is I mean obviously you'd love to have to be the sole game in town on certain things, but at the moment, is there any com competition in those areas that you're targeting? Um, so, in terms of the, the Cryptococcus, the, there is there is a, um, some competition there. Um, what we have identified is that there's um, certain elements of their test that that we believe that we can improve on, um, which then gives us that differentiator. Um, and then, in terms of TB, the, the, again, it's similar. There, there is a the test that's that's just come into the market. But again, there's certain features there that, that that we believe we can improve on, and then I think what, when we when we bring those into the market with those improved features, along with it being a CD4, along with the CD4, you know, it's a one-stop shop for those 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 organisations to procure from as well. It's a strategy there. Okay. Yeah, and if you sort of like again, I'm sort of like um, I'm, <laughs> nobody's going to hold you to this, Colin. Okay, but the sort of shape of the business in about five years' time. I say, hopefully, every, the world has turned back, gone to, to, to normality, and you've got these these products and stuff. You're currently doing, or estimates for uh, FinCap of twelve point six million revenue. But what you've just talked about, I mean, how, what, just organic. What are you like thinking of over the next five years that this business has the potential to sort of deliver uh, in, in sort of revenues? I mean, I know it's a range, and it all depends on take up and technology but the board's aspirations which again is just broad brush are you looking to double over five years or even moonshot higher i don't know i think i think our, our expectation would be significantly higher than where, where we are today um so i think we'd be yeah um very disappointed if we if we only ended up in a position where we doubled our revenues in five years i think i've already sort of outlined the potential in food where you know yeah. you know the, the, if we if we get America cracked, then you know, you, you're looking at you know a, a thirty to forty million pound business a, a, alone, and then you know if you're looking at um, as you as you look forward five years, CD four I touched on a capacity of six million tests at four dollars, you know that's uh, twenty four million dollars on that test alone, and then you you those other two tests are probably combined something similar. TB, I mean TB, you know, it, it, this this those numbers were based on on people living with HIV. TB is a far bigger problem than just um, people with it, with HIV with TB. So that market is even bigger. So again, you could see where where a global health business could be a sort of similar size um, to that. So you, you're you're heading towards the, you know, eighty to hundred million pound business, um, and that's without excluding COVID, um, in in a sort of five year five year window. Um, right. And clearly, okay. as, as, so I'm just going to add, and cl clearly, you know, as as we as we grow, then there may be other opportunities, not just to 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 grow organically, but but through through acquisition as well. It's not something that we're okay. you know I've got enough I've got enough on my plate just now over the next yeah uh, no, three, you're, three you're a busy man. I've met Boris um, on the phone quite often as well. So <laughs> like, no, I'm sorry, now you're getting on with your capacity. Please, could you increase it immediately? Now, if you just indulge me, I'm a bit of a sort of like a, a finance man. Um, the, the gross margins is roughly around about 64%. So if we just sort of like, you know, hypothetically talked about the, the, the revenues, 80 to 100 mil, a lot of that is just going to drop through to the bottom line, particularly when you've already sized the business in terms of, um, you know, capacity in, in Scotland, isn't it? So uh, you would be surprised if your gross margins fell from current levels in given the, the revenue increase in sort of five years time? 
Yeah, I, mean, I, I think, I mean, in terms of the, um, the food and the global health, so CD4, for example, th those gross margins are around about the sort of 65, 70% mark. Um, yeah. And clear, clearly, as you, um, as you scale up and, and produce more, then there's opportunities to, in terms of your buying power as well, um, to, to obviously further help, help those, those margins as well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one final question, just on the um, the antigens, which is, a lot of people have asked actually, is the um, is whether the MoLogic agreement, the antigen testing, is is it exclusive? Um, no, it would not. It's not exclusive. I mean, I, I think, and again, we, we we touched on it in terms of the capacity that's needed. Um, so 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 the, it's very much you know the, there's a the, the we a need for um, you know. A, Having as many part player, players in, in 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 play here to be able to deliver um, on on the commitments. Um, I mean, I think you know, depending on 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 demand from the UK side of things, clearly, um, if there is additional capacity, then we've got our. The reason that we've tied in with MoLogic is that we obviously have our distribution channels that we can utilise. Um, we're obviously very well connected with the WHO, um, and clearly, you know, last week's announcement with SD and Abbott as well. You know they're they're expressing an interest um, in in the test as well. So, um, cl clearly for me, it's very much UK first. But whatever yeah. whatever is left, we would we would obviously look to um, utilise, and we, we do have those those um, um, connections, especially with the likes of WHO. Okay, actually, one question just on that is uh, is India. You mentioned your priorities at the moment are obviously the UK, but there's been a lot of interest in terms of uh, or questions coming in in terms of opportunities with India, which I think was mentioned in the FinCap note. Yeah, I mean, I think um, the in terms of India, that, that's probably I think the questions are probably referring to is, is the the Eliza test. Um, you know, it, yeah. it has taken us longer to to to. Um, secure demand there than, than we expected. I, I think, to be honest, I think in terms of India, clearly they've got a huge, huge problem just now, and and I think it, mm. you know a lot of that is probably you know there's a need for antigen testing. Um, the and, and that's probably that is pro pro probably where their focus is and why it has taken us a little bit longer to secure secure those orders. I mean, we have had some sales in India, but it's not to the levels that um, perhaps people were expecting. Yeah, and on the um, with the the UK RTC um, contract, etc., or getting those first orders, the commercial agreement. When do you think that is going to be signed? Because there's, there's people asking about sort of the M MOU expired on the Friday the ninth or something of um, of October, if that's correct. Yeah, um, I, I I think in terms of uh, my, as I said said in the presentation, I expect that to be very soon. Um, okay, and. The, oh, yeah. You know, so, yeah, very soon. Okay, great. Well, I think we're probably covered just about all of it. And uh, have you got enough management resource up there in Scotland? You must be uh, working twenty four seven, I imagine, you and your team. Yeah, no, we, we, we're we're okay. We've we've uh, we've got a very focused team, and I've got well, I've actually got a great team around me. And I think you know, yeah. and and all all our employees in, in Omega have really risen to the challenge as well. So you know they, they they are working extremely long and hard hours um, because they realise that you know they, we need to get these tests out to make to make a difference in people's lives. So you know that's what motivates. Yeah. That's it's the good thing about being a diagnostic company is that you know when you're when you are driving to work is that you are you know that you are making a difference to people's lives. It's uh, it's, it's you know very very rewarding. Yeah, well, I think I'll just reciprocate from the whole of the audience. You know, a big thanks to you and your team because. Uh, you're doing the you're doing the country a great service, and you know if you can, please keep up the great work. Procure that equipment for your factory as fast as you can, and hit the uh, you know get the tests out as as, as quickly as we can to uh, to people who do need it because uh, it's a, it'll be make a massive difference to everybody's lives, both on a health basis and on the you know on the economy base. So uh, thanks very much, Colin, mm -hmm. for your time. Really interesting, and fascinating. You've got three really good sort of like you know at least three. Very good long-term um, growth opportunities there, and uh, you know the business could um, you know, this this could really do very well both on a on a financial, but also on the on a public interest basis. So uh, anyway, thanks very much for your time, Colin, and uh, look forward to speaking to you going forward. Yeah, thank you, much appreciated. That concludes it, guys.